All right, folks. Well, huge treat for us here today because I have none other than uh, legendary guitar shredder Vivian Campbell on the line. Uh, I, I would, I, I guess, last in line, River Dogs, Def Leppard. There's a whole slew of things. Yeah. <laughs> but but I think I think right off the top, I think we've got uh, we've got last in line. Uh, the record dropped on Frontiers February twenty second. Uh, first of all, congratulations on a, on a great record. Thank you very much, Jack. Yeah, we're we're very, very, very pleased with it, you know, collectively and, and on a personal level. I, I think it's some of my best playing. Um, I'm very comfortable, very confident in my playing of lit, and uh, Last in Line is a perfect showcase for us. So the, the record really, it's really blessed for us and, you know, really sounds like a band's second album, like we've really found our, our sound and identity on this record, which is one of the reasons why we just elected to call it two. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> keep, it, keep it simple and straightforward. So yes, I am in Def Leppard and Last in Line. And, you know, you were starting to mention a bunch of other bands. Yeah, I've got a very colorful history, but um, <laughs> last last 27 years, um, I'm the new guy in Def Leppard and, and to this day still. And when I'm not working with Def Leppard, I'm working with Last in Line. So keep For it sure. busy, you know? Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And I, I do want to talk about, about Leopard in a second. But uh, I, I mean, I guess, you know, one of the... You know, uh, interesting, fascinating, uh, you know, probably strengths of Last in Line, of course, is your relationship with, uh, you know, v- Vinny Apice, uh that, that goes back all the way to the to the Dio days, right? Yeah, well, the, the origins of the Last in Line band uh, was put together as a, a fun project. I, I never intended or thought it would get this serious, but it was a, a little fun get-together just to play and, and reconnect um with Vinny, as you mentioned, the original drummer, and Jimmy Ben, who was the original bass player. Yes, the, that's right. Uh, and so, so Jimmy and Vinny and I, together with Ronnie Dio, back in late 1982, we formed the original Dio band, and we, we wrote and recorded and toured the Holy Diver album, and then the Last in Line album. Right, and right. And then the Sacred Heart album before I, I got canned halfway through the, the Sacred Heart tour. But uh, Last in Line album, obviously from 1984, that's the album from which we took our name. And to be honest, I, getting on to the name of the two albums, our, our latest release, I mean, I, I another reason for naming it two was just to kind of simplify that process because had I known this project was going to get this serious, I, I never would have called it Last in Line. Um, like I said, we, we got together about a year, year and a half after Ronnie had passed away. Yeah. And um, our intention was just, well, at first just to jam. And then uh, yeah. Vinny introduced me and Jimmy to, to Andrew Freeman, who's this great, great singer who doesn't sound anything like Ronnie. He doesn't have a similar tonality. I mean, Ronnie was, was the best of the genre, very unique yeah. in his tonality. But, but Andrew is like a really powerful and emotional, strong, soaring singer in his own right. And, and so I just kind of had this idea to go out and just play some shows in, in the Los Angeles area where we were all living at the time to, yeah. and just to call it Last in Line and, and play the songs from our early careers with Ryan. Sure. Um, like I said, I had no idea we were going to get to the stage and here we are talking about uh, our second album of, of original music in yeah. the years we've been together. It just kind of grew and grew and grew and, and I know there is some confusion for people who, who are not familiar with the history as to why this band is named after <laughs> an existing album from 1984, but that, that yeah. was it. I mean, you know, the Last in Line was the song, the title track of, of the, the namesake 1984 album. And, yeah. and you yeah. know, we, we, like I said, we wrote and recorded and toured that along with the other early records with Ronnie. And, and so we go out and we play songs uh, from the early Dio catalog mm-hmm. for his first mm-hmm. albums and, as well as songs off of this new album and, and our debut album for 2016 which is called Heavy Crime yeah now you know what I've always wanted to ask. I mean, this is a bit of a sidestep because I definitely want to get into your process and everything. But uh, you know, a few a few years ago now, there was a, a Dio tribute album that came out, and uh, Tenacious D did the uh, Last in Line track and actually, uh, you know, won a Grammy for it. I, I'm just curious, you know, as to uh, a, a person wow. that uh, you know p- played on on the iconic original track, kind of how you felt about uh, the Tenacious D cover, and if you had heard it or were aware of it. I, I, I have no idea, Jack. That's news. I didn't even know it existed, let oh. alone that it won a Grammy. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's amazing. <laughs> um, so, no, obviously, I've never heard. I, I, I remember hearing Tenacious D doing a Dio, a song about Dio, something about passing the sword. It, it was original uh, Tenacious D track. I mean, this is 
many, many, many years ago when Lonnie was still alive. I remember hearing that and and reading something that that, uh, that he had met Ronnie and they collaborated on something or other. But I, I had no idea that, that he had done a, a version of the Last in Line song. That's amazing. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I was. Uh, I mean, I, I I enjoyed it. I mean, I I took it for what it was. Your iconic guitar solo on the track was covered by uh, recorders, harmonized recorders. <laughs> it's a pretty interesting take on the whole thing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's, it's always very flattering when, when somebody uh, references something you've done in your career. You know, re- regardless of of whether it's uh, uh, an authentic cover or or a parody or something or whatever it is. You know, it's just it's it's still all very flattering. You know, for sure. He was a fan. And, <laughs> That was good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, now you know. Getting getting back to it. I mean, you were talking about how uh, Last in Line is sort of you know the original three. Uh, you, Vinny, and of course Jimmy, uh, who passed away uh, not too long ago. Um, I I know when I was talking to Vinny about this, he mentioned that when you guys get together for Last in Line, that you're uh, you're always writing like in the room, like you know every member of the band is always present for the writing process. I mean, is that f- a fairly accurate description? description of how you guys work together uh, especially on the two album well yeah everyone's involved in every single song that's for sure um we're not always in the room together uh, andrew now lives in las vegas and has done for the past several years sure um so he's not always available to be in los angeles with the rest of us when we have the writing sessions having said that I, I, frequently he was just not always um when andy is not available we would record Vinny and and Phil and myself would record the ideas and send them on to Andy and Andy would uh, either work with what we send him or if he wanted to rearrange something you put it in the Pro Tools and, and chop it about a bit. Um, but yeah, every, every single song that that this band has ever written uh, on the two album and on the Heavy Crown album with Jimmy when Jimmy was still alive, mm-hmm. uh, they were all collaborative songs. I mean, they all we kind of grow them from the ground up. That's just how it works with this band. You know, we, yeah. we start with a, a germ of an idea, uh, either uh, a bass riff or a guitar riff, or even sometimes a drum beat, or sometimes Andy would just have a title. You know, we, we just kind of throw stuff around, and, and it's, it sparks the imagination of of each of us, and, and we kind of chip in, you know. And, and more often than not, we can do it that way, and it, yeah. it usually happens pretty quickly. And this all goes back to how we worked with Ronnie back in the early 80s. I mean, that's right. exactly how we, we did those early Dio songs. Um, for the most part, those those songs were all collaborative efforts, and, and they would start from from a, a musical idea, and, and usually Jimmy and Vinny and myself would kick something together, and then sure. Ronnie would come into the room later at night and we'd play what we had. And, and nine times out of ten, Ronnie would just open one of his lyric books and, and find something to sing on top of it. And occasionally he would make suggestions as to, you know, rearranging the musical parts. Yeah. It all happened yeah. very organically and very quickly. And, and for bands like Let the original Dio Band is the last line, that process works. Yeah. Um, I, I can tell you that process wouldn't work for Def Leppard. You know, well, that's way, what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Music is, is a very, very, very different process. But Def Leppard is a thoroughly unique band. There's not another band on the planet like Def Leppard, <laughs> and there probably never will be. And, and uh, the creative process in Def Leppard is much more nuanced and, yeah, and much yeah. more targeted, uh, much more involved and intricate. Um, but, you know, it's like I said, they're, they're two very, very different bands, which is why I, you know, I enjoy each equally. Uh, but but realizing that they're very very different, they both uh, you know they're both very different itches for me to scratch. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, well, and that that's good. I mean, you know, having a, a few different, uh, you know, irons in the fire, so to speak. I was just going to say, um, you know, v- Vinny uh, characterized uh, your relationship with him about how you, you know, you lock in uh, to, to a groove and, and you kind of work together and, you know, there's that similar magic that goes all the way back to the Dio band. I mean, how would you characterize your 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 process in locking in with the, the rhythm section in, in Def Leppard just to pivot a little bit? Um, the Leopard thing, it's, it's really different. I mean, Leopard's obviously a two guitar band. Uh, our guitar arrangements are much more orchestral and layered. You uh-huh. know, um, we're definitely more song focused in Def Leopard. It, it's much more craft involved mm-hmm. in the writing process. Um, with, with Last in Line, we tend to just go with, with our instincts. We're not looking to write a hit song in Last in Line, whereas with Def Leopard, we always are. I mean, we're always trying to, to, to reinvent the wheel with Leopard. Um, so, you know, the rhythm section in Leopard is, is also very, very, very unique. Obviously, you know, uh, Rick is 
a one-armed drummer. I mean, there's yeah. not many of those, you know. So, so his approach to playing is obviously very, very, very straightforward. Whereas Vinny Appice's approach to playing is is anything but straightforward. Um, you know, I find that that the, the process in, in Def Leppard we don't always necessarily write organically. Uh, yeah. So we don't always start together in a room the way Last in Line does or the way the original Beatle Band did. Um, you know, with with Leopard, we might just start writing with a click. The mm-hmm. drums are, are frequently one of the last things that we will approach to the to the song. And as such, you know, we have a lot of flexibility. And Def Leopard, we we the creative process uh, more often than not can morph from one thing to another. Uh, you know, we we could spend several days in Def Leopard working on a song, mm-hmm. and somebody comes into the studio one morning with a brain wave to take it in an entirely different direction. And even though we spent days building up a track, we can totally break it down and, and go off in, the, in pursuit of something entirely different. And it's nice to have that kind of flexibility with Jeff Leopard because that's just how Leopard works. And, and yeah. we're a very um, multi-genre sort of a band. I mean, you know, essentially Jeff Leopard is a hard rock band, but there's so, so much more to it. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've touched on a lot of different styles over the career of Jeff Leopard. Um, perhaps none more so than our most recent studio album which was a recent but it was late 2015 yeah, yeah. when the eponymous Def Leppard album came out but I mean there were a lot of different musical genres that we touched on in that uh, including some that we'd never <laughs> tackled before so you know it's it's a much more diverse animal Def Leppard and yeah. um, so a very like I said a very very different creative process where where everything is approached uh individually and and it's allowed a lot of flexibility the the the, the writing process with last in line is, is much more direct and, and much more organic and immediate yeah. and we're not looking for the same results as Def Leppard. like i say we're not we're not trying to 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 write uh a, not a pop song you know we're not trying to write a melodic song or something with a big radio hook yeah. you know occasionally in last in line we kind of have stumble across stuff like that like i think um the lead track off of the new album landslide uh, is particularly hooky, but but it's by accident, not design. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, that's kind of how we get to that. Uh, and you know, it's true with, with Dio. I mean, you know, the Rainbow in the Dark was the big song off of the Holy Diver album, uh, certainly in terms of radio popularity. And, and again, that was just something that happened by accident. You know, yeah. the, the the genesis of that track was originally a Sweet Savage song that I had written in my earlier years with my first band Sweet Savage back yeah, in Maryland yeah. and I, 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 I played the riff for Vinny and Vinny took the squareness out of it and really made it swing and then uh, you know Ronnie came in and, and heard what we had and really liked it and we recorded a demo of it and we had a little Yamaha DX7 keyboard set up in the corner of the rehearsal room and we were playing back the recording and Jimmy Bain wandered over to the to the keyboard and came up with the little keyboard hook you know that, that kind of was the icing on the cake and then all of a sudden Dio on our first album had a, a radio hit, you know. But again, it was it wasn't by design, you know. It was it was just a, a happy accident. Yeah. And, but that that's how rock, like hardcore rock bands, I think, kind of stumble across things like that. They don't really have an innate <laughs> sensibility to do it, you know. Yeah, I, I remember years ago, uh, this was maybe in about 2013, I want to say, I was talking to Vinny and he said that the the song Rainbow in the Dark at, at one point actually got optioned by the people that, that do the music, you know, the elevator music. Did you ever hear anything about oh. that? Oh, wow. <laughs> I, again, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I live under a rock. I'm always the last to do these things, but I, I know it has been in a few movies and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know it, it, it's a popular one from the catalog. I I actually haven't seen, I have no control over my publishing. I was young and foolish yeah. and, and signed my publishing away to, to the DOs uh, to, while we were making that record. And uh, so I, oh. I'm i kind of out of the loop out of all that stuff. You know, I don't actually yeah. uh, get informed as to how that music is used or even get paid for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> which is something I need to look into, but uh, yeah, that, that's yeah. a different story. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, you know, what is a current story, of course, is, uh, you know, Def Leppard being uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame March 29th. I mean, of, of all the bands and projects that you've worked with, I mean, did you ever think that Leopard would be the one to, uh, you know, get to uh, Cleveland, as it were? I, absolutely, yeah. And I think that Def Leppard more than deserves it. And, and I say that, you know, because I think I have a very unique perspective um, that's solely mine with, with regard to Def Leppard, having been in the band for 27 years as a new guy. Yeah, but for, for many, many, many years prior to that, I was a fan. 
uh, even going back before the first album, I remember buying the Wasted single, uh-huh. and uh, you know I was a fan of the band all the way up through that. So I, I think uh, Jeff Leppard wholly deserves to, to be in the Hall of Fame, and I think you know the industry accolades are something that the Jeff Leppard has been very short of. Um, I remember prior, like again prior to my being in the band back in 1987 buying the Hysteria album, not once, but twice. I bought it on cassette and played it so much, it yeah. started to lose its luster on cassette, <laughs> and I went out. It was one of the first early uh, CDs that I ever bought. And I remember being amazed, like a year, a year or two later, uh, watching the Grammys and, and thinking, you know, that not only did Def Leppard not win a Grammy for Hysteria or Paramania, which is another landmark record that came before it, yeah. uh, but the band didn't even get nominated for a Grammy. So I just find it, you know, that, that kind of frames my whole reference to how I think about these industry accolades, that it doesn't always reflect the band's credibility yeah. or musical success or commercial success. Um, you know, we've always, in Leopard, we've always put tremendous stock in our fan base and, and the fact that our fans have, have always been with us and have only grown in numbers over the years. And uh, I think that uh, I've said before, and I'll say again, the thing that resonates with us most about getting into the Hall of Fame is the fact that we won the biggest ever popular vote. Yeah, that does say and something. That really, that really speaks volumes about our yeah. fan base and, and what the band means to them and what they mean to us. And, and that's sure. the most important thing, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah, I think Leopard deserves to be there. I think it might be questionable as to whether or not I deserve to be there, but <laughs> as, as a as a 27-year member of the band who's recorded for over a quarter century with Def Leopard, I am eligible. So, yeah. um, but I'll also be sure that we don't forget Steve Clark on that night, you know, because oh. as a fan, preceding my involvement yes. with the band, Steve Clark's input was immense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I know we'll all be, you know, remembering Steve and and. and singing his praises that night and and also uh, on an associated level you know we we did I believe extend an invitation to um, Pete Willis original guitar player oh, wow. and I hope Pete shows up uh, you know he deserves to be in that would be so amazing but together with Steve that got the ball rolling yeah yeah, for sure. Well, now I know we don't. We're we're a little pressed for time here. So uh, I mean, I, I should mention the fact that uh, you guys are coming to Canada this summer, uh, in, including a, a little stopover at Saskatel Center in Saskatoon, July twenty seventh. I mean, h- how does the fan the the band feel about uh, you know Canada in general, performing in Canada and uh, and the Canadian fans? I mean, are are they are they different? I mean, are they the same? You know what I mean? Um, well, Canada's always been a special place for Def Leppard. Uh, going back uh, into the 1980s and, and the early 90s, and well, back back when people actually bought records and the like, right. uh, Def Leppard has always found that Canada was always our biggest per capita market, uh-huh. uh, even bigger than, than the United States. So wow. it's always been a special place for us. We've always done well in Canada. Um, when we do regular North American tours, it, it frequently involves... Uh, a Toronto show or a Vancouver show, or sometimes both. But every three to four years, we do try and, and do a more extended and more inclusive trip across Canada right. and take in places like, say, Saskatoon. We're going back to Halifax, where we haven't yeah. been in, in yeah, quite some time. And, you know, I, I know the response in all these places is going to be tremendous. And Montreal happens to be one of my personal favorite uh, cities to play in the entire oh, world. There you I've go. said this for years and years and years and years. Yeah. There's something about Montreal. It doesn't matter the band. It doesn't because I'm talking about Teo days and White yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, it doesn't matter the venue. Uh, it, there's something just there's a passion in, in that city, and I think it's true across the whole country. You know, right. for, for rock music. And of course, mid August, uh, starting around, uh, I think about August. 14th, if the date's correct, of course, is your Vegas res- residency. I-, I know fans really enjoyed the Viva Hysteria. I mean, is there ever a chance of, like, a, a, a speaking of Pete Willis, is there ever a chance of a Viva Pyromania type show? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure there is, you know. <laughs> um, I don't know what exactly we're going to do in, in Las Vegas this summer. We haven't planned the musical content or the production of the show yet. Uh, we just signed up to the idea of doing it uh, yeah. late last year, and uh, we won't see so you know we we finished our run of shows last year we finished in london uh, a week before christmas we haven't seen each other since we just sent a few emails but uh, we'll all be getting together in new york for several days around the hall of fame thing at the end of this month and 
that's when we'll actually sit down for the first time and, and start discussing the nuts and bolts of the Vegas performance. And right. what is good about Vegas is, is it allows you flexibility to do things you wouldn't normally consider doing on a touring rock show. Uh, you have to build an entire show, um, not just one aspect of the performance. When we played there, the only other time we've done a Vegas residency, as you mentioned, was 2013 when we did uh, the Hysteria album in sequence, but Hysteria is only 40, I don't want to say 47 or 49 minutes of music, yeah, something yeah. like that. It, it's certainly not enough to support a whole show, so we had to build a show around it, and we built a, a three-tiered show culminating in, in a big production with Def Leppard doing Hysteria in sequence, and, and in between that there was an intermission of a video collage we put together. Uh -huh. But prior to that, we actually were our own opening act in 2013. We went out as uh, Dead Flat Bird, uh -huh. and, and we all took on alter egos and Joe introduced <laughs> us as, as different people and we played some uh, deep album cuts we played yeah, some of yeah. songs including at least one song that the band had never ever ever performed live before and uh, it was challenging for us to prepare all of that but it was absolutely a hoot to do it and I'm not saying that we're going to do that again in, in Vegas this time but it, but it, that's that's an example of, of the latitude sure, that yeah. you, you know, to experiment to build up a Totally unique and bespoke uh, experience. Yeah, well, and that's definitely something for the fans to get excited about. I see here that tickets uh, went on sale to the public Friday, February 22nd, and I think there's some pre sales and different things that have already gone on. So uh, that, that that's very exciting. Well, Vivian, look, uh, I, I definitely appreciate uh, all the time you've given me today, man. It's always a pleasure talking with you, and, uh, you know, hopefully I'll get to uh, see you guys in Saskatoon. Okay, Jack, nice to talk to you. Yep. Well, yeah, have a good one. Bye-bye.